The League of Women Voters in the St. Cloud area would like to thank the city's administrative staff for making arrangements for us to meet in the city council chambers. This event is being broadcast live on Charter Channel 181. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. This means we do not support or oppose particular political parties or individual candidates, but we do study and take positions on issues. Members of the St. Cloud branch of the American Association of University Women are co-hosting with us this evening. Together, we believe informed citizens are the foundation of democracy. I am Linda Self, a member of the St. Cloud Area League. I will be your moderator tonight. Lolly Loomis and Susan Smith will be the timekeepers. A number of League and AAUW members are helping gather questions from the audience. We moderate candidate forums according to a standard protocol. The candidates have accepted the format in advance. We ask that forum participants follow the basic ground rules found on the sheets you receive entering the forum room. I will now review these rules with you. No campaign or partisan materials, for example, signs, buttons, literature, or printed apparel may be worn, displayed, or distributed in the forum room. Such materials can be offered on a table provided outside. Please silence personal devices such as cell phones and pagers. <laughs> the St. Cloud Area League of Women Voters reserves the right to tape and photograph this event and publish the results. Audience members, except for authorized persons, should refrain from using any electronic devices to record this forum. Anyone doing so in a way that is disruptive or distracting may be asked to leave. Questions will come from the audience in written form on the cards provided. Question facilitators will receive, sort, and forward audience questions to the moderator. Questions of a related nature may be condensed and combined, and we probably will not get to all the questions submitted this evening. Questions must be brief, and long statements will not be accepted. Questions should relate to specific issues the candidates would normally address as public officials in this particular office. Questions on unrelated topics or of a personal nature will not be allowed. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters St. Cloud. All candidates will be given a chance to answer each question. Participants are asked to remain quiet while candidates are speaking so that everyone can hear responses. <coughs> All applause will be held until the forum is complete and the moderator invites it. Audience members are invited to write questions on note cards and pass them to the end of the rows toward the center aisles. Question collectors, please raise your hands. Three question facilitators seated on my right will help develop the order of questions and combine <coughs> questions of a similar nature. The candidates are seated by board in alphabetical order by last name. Starting on my left, I am pleased to introduce Dave Masters, John Palmer, Liz Backlitch, Steve Laraway, Paul Brandmeier, John Libert, Mike Conway, and George Rindelow. The St. Cloud City Council is comprised of seven members split between four ward seats and three at-large seats. All seats are four-year terms. This year, the four ward seats will be on the November 6th ballot, and voters living in each ward will be asked to select one candidate. The candidates' opening statements will be offered in the order they are seated. After that, the order for answering will be rotated in a random manner. Candidates, you will
will each be allowed the following amounts of time. One minute for an opening statement, one and a half minutes to answer each question from the audience, and one minute for a closing statement at the end of the question and answer period. The timekeeper will hold up a yellow card when you have 30 seconds left. The red card that says time means finish your sentence and stop. The city, the St. Cloud City Council has important responsibilities, including zoning regulations, the adoption of city ordinances and resolutions, adoption of the annual city budget, and confirmation of mayoral appointments. In addition, council members who represent wards respond to the needs of their constituents. Candidates, for your opening statement, you will each have one minute to state why you are seeking the office of city council member. We will begin with Dave Masters. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for having this debate. Um, I think it's important to have uh, this um, put before the public. And for those of you that are here, I appreciate you coming out and those watching on TV. I thought, first of all, I would begin just uh, by stating a little bit about myself um, so you know who you're voting for if you uh, choose to support me in the upcoming election. I've uh, grown up in St. Cloud, lived here all my life. Uh, my grandfather had the Rainbow Cafe downtown. Um, my parents were um, involved in, in a, a lot of community activities as well. Um, myself, I've, uh, I'm a teacher in the St. Cloud School District. For, this is my 41st year, I teach tech ed. Um, I work uh, with a, I did work with the Youth Build program. We worked on over 30 habitat homes over the past 10 years. Um, I have served on the city council for three terms. I'm also a member of the HRA, uh, commissioner on the HRA. Uh, I've been on the EDA, I'm uh, currently on the park and rec board, and uh, I appreciate your support in the upcoming election. Thank you. John Palmer? I encourage you to go to my website for detailed information. I am an academic and I have a rather lengthy resume and I'm not going to cite from that. I want to make sure you know I'm a visitor. I have a lot of energy because if you go to the site, you'll see I'm a world record holder from my birthday. On my 70th birthday, I barefoot water ski. In this community for 43 years, I've been active with residents in Counter Christ, and I ask for your prayers. I'm going into the prison on the weekend of the 20th and 21st. And I believe, begin all good things by looking to scripture. <clears throat> Taken from 40 Days for Life's comments or scripture reading from Monday, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Thank you. Liz Beckridge. No, no, no. You said I could finish the sentence. I did not finish the reading. <laughs> You're done. We're going to continue. Liz Beckridge. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Beckridge. First of all, I just want to say I'm very grateful for this opportunity to come and sit in front of you and have a conversation in this format. And I'm looking forward to us being able to openly have it in, in a way that I think will be different because the rules have been clearly laid out, it's being filmed, and I expect that it will be handled in an open, honest manner. Um, I just wanna say thank you to all that are in attendance and also to the volunteers. Um, I'm running specifically because we have four points that need to be addressed. That's crime, economic development, personal freedom, and also, we need to talk about the people's voice because we have people in this community that are being silenced, and that should never happen. Everybody needs to be able to have their voice heard, and we need to be able to have some open, honest, hard conversations. And you never fix things by silencing people. You fix them by bringing things out into the open and talking about it. Um, we need change. The last thing I want to say is, is just in closing, on November 6th, I would appreciate Thank you, Steve Laraway. My name is Steve Laraway. I'm the current city council member representing Ward 
two. From a personal standpoint, I've been married for 41 years. I've lived at the same home in the second ward for 28 years. My wife and I raised four children in that home. I'm running for a very simple reason, and it's stewardship. I believe in giving back to the community that gave so much to me and my family. I'm very active in the community, in the healthcare field, youth, faith <coughs> community, business and economic development. My qualifications are I'm an attorney, CPA, certified financial planner, and chartered financial consultant. I have run and grown successful businesses as well. Some of my soft qualities are I'm a good listener, I demonstrate common sense, and I get along. And I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity tonight. Thank you, Paul Brandmeier. Good evening, everybody. I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, spending most of my childhood in Alaska, where my dad was a pastor of Anchorage Lutheran Church. My mom was a registered nurse. Three weeks after my high school graduation, I enlisted in the United States Air Force. During that service time, I lived and worked around the world, spending most of my time in Europe and the Middle East. When I retired from the service in 1998, I took a job which brought me to Minnesota, and I've been here ever since. In the service, I held various jobs in law enforcement, nuclear missile operations, logistics, aircraft operations, search and rescue, and the air defense control centers. I was an assistant manager at Home Depot and a shift manager at Pizza Hut, taught driver's ed, economics at the College of St. Scholastica, operations management at SCSU. Drove school bus for a while, Sauk Rapids Rice School District, currently drive for Shill Trucking Incorporated in St. Augusta. I have an associate's degree in criminal justice, a bachelor's degree in business administration, and a master's degree in administration. Thank you. Thank you. John Liver. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to uh, say that I appreciate you coming because you care as much as I do. Uh, my name is John Liver. I'm married uh, to the lovely wife, Linda. I have three daughters. I am retired. I was at Lake Motor Company for 39 years in the management positions most of the time. I've been on the city council for 11 years. I'm also on the executive board of the area, chief, or area planning organization. I'm one of the founding members of the, uh, the St. Cloud uh, um, Development PDA board, or Economic Development Board. Uh, I'm a, uh, on the St. Cloud Visitor Convention Bureau Board, an ex officio of the Violent Offenders uh, Gang and Task Force. I'm on Metro Plus Board of Directors, past member of three high school board of directors. Uh, to give you a little background, my family's been in St. Cloud for over 160 years. I've been, went to St. Mary's, I went to uh, grade school, I went to Cathedral High School, I went to St. Cloud State. Uh, I have a passion for St. Cloud and I, I don't want anything to go wrong. I, I, I'm trying to make it better. Thank you. Mike Conway. Thanks, Linda. First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Mike Conway. I would also like to very much thank and all the volunteers. This is not an easy thing to put on. It takes a lot of coordination and effort, so I want to say thank you very much. A little bit about myself. I've been a St. Cloud resident since uh, 91. I remember all my kids around the snowstorm. We all remember that year. I uh, raised uh, three children that all went to Tech High School. Two of them still live in the area. I have six grandkids. Um, well, I should say my wife and I have six grandkids. She always corrects me. She should. Um, I've been a hockey coach with St. Cloud Youth Hockey for many years. I've been involved in the community um, off and on in different things. Um, I've worked with Walter School of Financial Services for 18 years. I'm part of the sales team there. Um, basically, when people ask what I'm running for and what I'm running, what I'm running for, it's basically simple. Conservative, common sense leadership. Um, this, that is something that we need to be able to, to, to go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. George Rindelow. Hello, uh, I'm George Rindelow. I've been running for Fourth Ward City Council. Thank you, Linda, and thanks for all you folks uh, for being here, and uh, a special thanks to League of Women, Women Voters for putting this, uh, this event on. It's, uh, it's a very important event for our community. Um, as I uh, said, I'm George Rindelow. Um, I've lived in the St. Cloud Fourth Ward for the past 30 years. My wife, Marianne, and I have raised three boys here. I served as the Stearns County Administrator for 28 years, retiring in 2016. I have 33 years of local government experience. I have also served as a budget analyst for two years for the Wisconsin State Legislature. 
master's degree in public administration from the University of Wisconsin. I was born and raised in Marshall, Minnesota, and I'm running for city council because I wish to use uh, my extensive experience and skill set to serve the residents of our great city. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start with our first question, and the question is, as a future city council member, what would be your responsibility, if any, to open up avenues for the participation of all residents in the St. Cloud community? And we're going to start with John Palmer. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. That's one of the four issues that my campaign is formed around, being a voice for the people. Now, I've watched the city council for a year. I participated as well as I could. I found that the council has a structure that, uh, in my opinion, uh, restricts public input from the citizens. Uh, I would move to have a reform that would have all items that are voted on by the city council open for public comment immediately before the council votes, instead of two weeks before, and then wait. I believe very much in the right of the citizens to express themselves, given by the First Amendment. I believe that each and every resident of St. Cloud should have equal opportunity to speak to this body, the city council, and I am a good listener. With the remaining time, I'm going to finish Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. Be put away from you all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's an attitude that I'll take in listening to the citizens. John Libert. Thank you. Uh, what would I do? I, I, I live and breathe St. Cloud, I am available. This week alone, I, today I've uh, had an email from a gentleman who wanted me to look at his neighborhood because he was concerned about weeds and uh, the uh, condition of the neighbors. I've handled that one. Uh, yesterday it was a woman that uh, was concerned because there were some burglaries in her neighborhood and she was concerned that she hadn't heard anything. So I made about a half a dozen phone calls to the police department, found out exactly what was going on and how the process of the uh, investigation was. I am available all the time. Uh, I get calls, I react. I may be just the filter to get to the right person in the administration to answer the questions. Uh, it's, uh, and that's one of our jobs. We have to be out there. I'm always out and about with people. I go to Summertime by George. I walk through the crowds and talk to people. I'm available whenever they're around. Our city council, uh, we, have, we have to control a little bit. It's, it's, it's a meeting for the public but it's not a public meeting, it's, it's a meeting for the city council. So you have to be very careful that you can keep control of what's going on and not lose control of it. Uh, there's still plenty of opportunity where the citizens can talk to us. Uh, we may not agree, and that's one of the problems we've had is people are saying we're not listening. It's, we may not, li we're listening plenty, but we may not agree with it. And it sounds like, it was, reminds me of when my kids grew up, were younger, when I, I did something that they didn't like, um, they said I wasn't listening. Thank you. Steve Larroway. Thank you. In my role with various uh, nonprofits and other organizations, uh, I've been involved in recruiting lots of people to uh, board, as board members, as committee members, and that sort of thing. And I feel that's my role as a uh, to the city as well. So I'm constantly uh, going to meetings, uh, at public events, looking for people and talking to them and being a walking, talking, marketing council person uh, for the city of St. Cloud and trying to get them involved. When I was recruiting for uh, board members of various organizations, I always felt that the makeup of the board should represent the makeup of the cities that we represented or the entities that we represented. So 
from that standpoint, I'm looking for uh, members that can add diversity, that can add uh, good ideas, that have the skills that we need, and uh, I just want to be a welcoming uh, person to those and try to recruit them to uh, get involved in committees or run for office or, or do this or that. So that's how I would address that. George Mitterland. Indulge me and just uh, repeat that question again, please. As a future city council member, what would be your responsibility, if any, to open up avenues for the participation of all residents in the St. Paul community? Well, first of all, I support the city council's resolution uh, regarding uh, being a welcoming city. I think that uh, uh, folks that uh, are uh, interested in a moratorium on refugee resettlement really ought to be talking to their congressional delegation and not, not the city. As uh, in my previous life, I served as a, I was a teacher for five years, and I taught uh, high school civics. Um, so I taught uh, high school civics. Uh, we talked a lot about the difference between the federal, the state, local governments, counties, and cities. And in those cases, uh, what you learn is what the responsibilities of each of those offices and each of those uh, uh, levels of government happen to be. And quite frankly, when it comes to immigration and those kinds of things, it's really a federal issue. And uh, that's really where I stand on that. Mike Conway. Thank you for having me repeat there, George. I was going to have you the same thing. <laughs> um, I guess one of the things, you know, to open up participation, um, I spent 15 of my 18 years with Walter Schooler as a trainer and implementation consultant. And what that meant is everywhere I showed up was a change event for that organization. That was the bringer of change. And one of the things that I learned in doing that job, and, and it's one of my former supervisors, I have to give him credit for that, and if he's watching, he'll know what I mean. One of the questions that we often asked when we weren't understanding the question or understanding where position somebody was taking was, help me understand. And that question to me is something we need to be able to do as a community. We have a lot of misunderstandings going on. And the part of being able to bring people into the organization, into any organization, is trying to figure out where they're coming from. So I found many times that simple question, help me understand, has been a very powerful statement. And I, I really, that's one of the questions that I would bring up whenever I'm dealing with an issue in the city. We have a lot of issues that we have to deal with. Being inclusive, it's very simple, you're being open and honest and listen to what people are telling you. You may not agree, you're right, but at least acknowledge that they have a right to feel that way and then follow up with, help me understand. That is a big, powerful statement. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Brennmeyer. One of the things you learn when you, when you go into basic training is how to get along with people. They throw 48 people into this uh, one open bay. They cut all your hair off, make you dress alike, look alike, think alike, walk alike, talk alike. And uh, after hours, what you do is you sit around, you talk to each other, and you get to know each other. And um, there's people from ethnicities and backgrounds that um, I, as a kid that grew up in Alaska, really never had much experience with. But then when you get to be an NCO and then a commissioned officer, you learn real quick how to deal with people, how to listen to what their problems are, because that's your job um, as a manager, is to figure out what the issue is and get down to the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it, trying to figure out how you can stop it. And like Mike just said, a big part of that is listening, listening, getting down to the source. And um, sometimes you gotta tell some people uh, you know, that it's not necessarily what they wanna hear, Sometimes they just have to accept that. Um, but that's the biggest thing is just go out and get, get the communication going, uh, listen to what they have to say, come up with some, some uh, suggestions, some alternatives, and uh, try to work for compromise. Thank you. Liz Backlitch. 
when we're talking about participation by all, um, I, I think that's a fantastic thing for us to be discussing. Um, I've been holding listening sessions. I want people to come talk to me. And it's amazing what you find out when you start having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that don't involve fingers being wagged in faces and in people being silenced. Um, I would either second or I would propose what Dr. Palmer said, which is the ability to address the council for a second time. Um, I think after you address the council for the first time, when an issue is first brought up, what ends up happening is, is you go home and you start talking to your neighbors about it, and different items come up that make that are different things that the council could need to hear. And we never get a chance to come back and readdress council and say, hey guys, you missed, if you make this move, then this, 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 and this follows. And, and I think that council is better when we end up with all of the citizens being involved and participating in the process. We need, as a council, we need to have the council and the citizens count <coughs> all of them. So um, I would either propose or, or second uh, the ability to address council a second time. Um, that's where I am. Thank you. Dave Masters. You know, I, I would start off by saying that, um, you know, I, I take it very seriously <laughs> representing the citizens of Ward 1, and I look. I seek input, I seek dialogue in terms of issues that arise. I have an open door policy, they can call me at any time, send me an email, I've had uh, constituents come to my home, we've had discussions about various topics that were raised on the city council, uh, met in coffee shops. So I feel that um, I'm open to that dialogue. I, I want to have that communication. I want to be their voice on the city council. Um, in my daily work uh, as a teacher, you know, I work with students every day. I, I dialogue, have input with students. So, you know, I, over the years, I, I feel that I've become pretty skilled in re relation to uh, listening and communicating with others. Uh, another issue would be, you know, my opponent, for example, has talked about that there, there isn't enough, um, we're not listening to residents on the city council. You know, I, I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, we do have an open forum. Uh, citizens can come forward, they can speak at that time. They can also follow up with another discussion. Call me at home, you know, send me an email, you know, have more dialogue with it. And I haven't seen that from this group. They've come forward to the city council, they've, you know, requested certain things, but there's, it's a large community, and it's a large ward, and there's many people who have different viewpoints in relation to some of these topics. So you have to take all of it into consideration when you are making a decision on the council. Thank you. Thank you, and our next question is, what specific steps would you take, if any, to revitalize development in downtown and east side St. Cloud? And we're going to start this time with John Libert. Thank you. Uh, economic development is one of my main uh, pride points in St. Cloud. We've been trying, we need to create an image of St. Cloud need to create an image of downtown. People don't come to a city that has a bad image. We have to uh, create an atmosphere. We have to have a uh, vibrant community, and downtown is, is a very important uh, area. At the Economic and Development Authority, we've been working specifically trying to get uh, federal funds and different, we, we can really concentrate. It's not like you can just say, I want the business to come here and they're going to come. You have to sell it. You have to uh, focus on it in the, uh, uh, economic development is focusing very strongly on that. We have programs that we're looking at for east side development. Uh, downtown, uh, there's uh, the downtown organizations working on a tax area that I support. I think it would be a good thing for that. They can put money into it. I, I'm passionate for downtown. I want to I want to dream downtown. I've been to uh, <coughs> literally stop at some of the cities uh, in, that have interesting downtowns where they have stores that people go to. I went to one store, they had a, one, one city had a 7-Up store, all they had a 7-Up. But every other uh, building down there, there's pride. And uh, we need the pride of the owners downtown, the business owners, and uh, we need to help them help themselves. That's the important thing. We can't create something if they're not going to help us. George Rendell. Uh, 
couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, a number of years ago, uh, I represented the county on the uh, uh, downtown council, and uh, we worked very hard to try to promote businesses and to try to bring in new businesses uh, uh, to the downtown area. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we obviously had to do was work closely uh, with uh, private and public uh, investment really is essential to uh, getting the downtown uh, uh, back to probably where we want it to be and uh, really where it is today. When I first started uh, uh, on that council, we still had a ring road. And uh, you could shoot a cannon down uh, St. Germain and you wouldn't hit anything. And I think over the years, the downtown council, in cooperation with the city of St. Paul, has really done a lot to try to spruce up downtown. Uh, the other thing that's absolutely key to downtown, and I've talked about this with a number of my residents, and that is you have to have a safe downtown. Public safety is essential. People are not going to go downtown and, and, uh, and uh, go, any the, go to any of the businesses or use any of the restaurants or the theaters or, or the bars or anything like that if they don't feel safe. So, I think uh, public safety is really a key aspect to any of the uh, work that we do downtown here. <coughs> I think those are all very good points. Um, I like the idea of working with the St. Cloud Downtown Council. Um, I've often thought about what we could do to revitalize downtown, actually, even long before I even thought about running for council. Um, I think in order for people to go downtown, because it's too easy to go out to the you know, crossroads, but for people to go downtown, they, gotta, they have to go down there for a reason. I think it needs to be a destination. And I like the idea that Fifth Avenue Live that started up this year. I think that's a pretty cool idea, you know, where they close off a couple of streets. We should do that more, do that more often, because that draws people in, gets people outside, gets to meet each other. Um, I think it's a pretty cool idea. Uh, I know Dave Kleiss has got a, uh, a, a Von Knotts Mart, or a Chris Kendall Mart, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it's only like one night or something in the, in the Christmas season. I bet you we could expand that. I've always thought about talking to him about that. Uh, where we could have um, maybe, a, <clears throat> excuse me, like a, like a crafts uh, deal where people could set up a crafts booth and sell homemade products uh, to people coming downtown. I think that the uh, various street, uh, street fests and things like that, if you go down to the block party with uh, St. Mary's, uh, that's, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> a lot of people there. People come downtown for these things. They come down. But one of the things that's a, that's a bad thing, uh, and I know that for a, a limited time there, we had parking meters uh, disappeared. Man, that was a great time, wasn't it? Parking meters were gone. People came downtown. I know it's only a quarter for a half an hour, but uh, you can only park for two hours before you got to move. Uh, it's my time to. Hey, bastards. Yes, I would agree that um, you know having a healthy downtown provides for a healthy community. It's really key to a community to have uh, a vital and active downtown. Um, in the 11 years that I've been on the council, you know, I've seen a lot of development brought forth by the city, and, and the city council played a role in, in supporting that and voting for that. Uh, new library, new police station, new fire station, um, you know, the uh, convention center expansion, parking ramps, uh, renovations to Lake George. There, there's just endless number of projects that have been taken um, and worked through during that 11 years. And, and investments like that by the city help revitalize the city and attract other businesses to come to St. Cloud and, um, and find it a great place to be. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, investing in infrastructure, um, you know, our, our task on the city council is to allocate funds for roads, for uh, water, sewer, um, you know, some of those things. And so we are constantly looking at ways to uh, $18 million being spent in the upcoming year on roads improvements, those kinds of things. So I think uh, being a city council member and looking at the priorities and how the funds are allocated to make improvements in the city will help uh, spur development within the community. John Palmer. First, I'd, ask, first I'd like to ask my uh, former student. Who do you refer to as these people or what people? Well, I heard that comment in passing. I don't know what you're talking about. I can tell you that from a marketing standpoint, brand is earned. Brand is earned. It's not created. It is not created. And if everything is so good, 
in, our, in this community, uh, why is it we have all these empty storefronts? Empty storefronts all over town. Uh, I'm a small business owner on the east side. I don't see any effort to work with the individuals that have had businesses on the east side for 30 and 40 years. I get a sense that some people are embarrassed that there's auto repair shops along Lincoln Avenue Southeast. I think it's a big asset. I do think that the city suffers, that the council and the establishment suffers from a problem that I would call, they think the city is divided by a river named denial. There's a lot of denial of a reality. Let me give one example. Spot Crime is a website that I subscribe to that shows every crime that happens within 10 miles of my home. People that are concerned about downtown ought to look at spot crime because I can tell you, when I look at that report that comes weekly, the vast majority of the crimes are occurring in spot crime area downtown. Earn the brand. Yes, Backwich. <laughs> Off. I don't know who asked this question, but thank you, because that's one of the biggest things. I've actually done a walking tour where I filmed all of the empty storefronts that are on the southeast side. My comment about revitalizing downtown would be, first of all, we do need to address uh, public safety. There was a survey that was done uh, where the citizens had the opportunity, it was mailed out, and we had the opportunity to respond to it. Do you know 60% of the people who live in the city of St. Cloud who responded to that survey are afraid to go downtown at night? You read through it and you start learning amazing things. And when you start having conversations with people that are one-on-one, -on -one, where they're not afraid to talk because they know they can trust you and they know they can open up to you, you start learning some really interesting things. Private ownership is important. We also need to start removing regulations. I watched somebody come to the last city council meeting who all he wanted to do was make a sign one foot larger. He was on the fourth step in the process when he showed up here. And what happened was is our city council decided to give him another meeting where he needed to go through so there's another step. And if he passes through that, that public hearing, the, the meeting, it's a public hearing, if he passes through that, he still doesn't get a sign. He has to go through another step. And we've got to start removing regulations. And the biggest thing, Southeast Side needs parking. And our city council at that point destroyed the Southeast Side. They went in and they put lovely cobblestone sidewalks because they were going to create a mall. They created a four-lane four road that was supposed to go all the way to the mall, and the mall is dying. It's not going to be completed. Thank you. Steve Lerley. Thanks for this question. Uh, two things that are near and dear to me. Uh, first of all, I am a member of the Downtown Council, and I see what's going on. I see what's planned, and I think Jolene Foss has done a tremendous job in the time that she's been there. I think what you need to do for the downtown is be an advocate. The mission statement of downtown concepts, we want the downtown to be an attractive, dynamic, and economically progressive urban center valued at the heart of the region. Um, I think what we need to do is attend the events. We have a wonderful theater on one end of the downtown of Paramount. I jotted down four events that I've been to since the middle of August. Uh, the, recently, the Armadillos did Music. I was there the Neighborhood Coalition fundraiser. I was there the Great Theater put on My Fair Lady. I was there at Autumn Moon event, which was a fundraiser for the Paramount. I was there as well. These are all great events out downtown. So pay patronize those businesses. I would like to see a mini police station, if you will, walking the, with the police officer walking the beat downtown. On the east side, we're working very hard to get the east side boosters back running. We've got some passionate people that are working on that. We're going to try to schedule a meeting that will do some visioning. I also recognize that. I also have thought of many times that the view from the river on the east side looks very similar to the view from the river on the west side. Yeah, I'd like to also say thank you to whoever asked the question. Um, it's interesting because we, we talk about St. Cloud as the downtown, and that area needs right a lot of uh, revitalization, and it does. And, and, and uh, George was absolutely right, and I've heard Liz mention a few other people. 
Um, there's a lot of people that just do not go downtown after pick a time. They don't want to be down there at night. There's a lot of crime. There's a lot of things that need to be dealt with in the downtown area. When I was out talking to my constituents, you hear the, the, the people that vote for, for me in the fourth ward. Not there yet. Um, it's, it, it's interesting because crime is a major thing that needs to be dealt with, not just in downtown, but specifically downtown. And that's what we want that area to be a shining beacon. But that area then as the shining beacon needs to radiate out to the other parts. It needs to go across the river to the east side. There's large expanses of developing or, or waiting to be developed land on the east side. There's a lot of the southeast side of the right to lie in that whole ball area over there is gone as far as being relevant to the neighborhood. There's other areas in the city that are wastelands when it comes to grocery stores or to, to convenience stores. So we need to look at how do we expand the development that's happened? Fifth Avenue and St. Germain, the development that's happened there in the last two years, a couple of years, phenomenal. That area is going. But we need to figure out how do we look at St. Cloud development as a holistic approach, not just downtown. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is, what steps would you like to see St. Cloud take to reduce waste such as eliminating styrofoam, plastic bags, etc. Do you have ideas about how to reduce St. Cloud's waste? And we're going to start with Liz Backlinch. <laughs> Talking about steps to eliminate waste. Interesting. Um, I recycle. I, I think that's first and foremost is continuing through with that process. I have not delved into what our garbage collectors go through and, and what they deal with, and I also have not looked into what the costs are. So that would be something, if we're going to sit down and have a conversation on this, I would want to become better informed. And that's one thing that you guys will learn from me, is if I'm going to tackle something, I'm going to tackle it head on. I'm going to research it thoroughly, and I'm going to talk to people who are going, oh, well, no, we don't want to recycle that, or maybe we should eliminate the styrofoam in restaurants. I know some of this has been discussed in, in relationship to what's been going on in California, and I have caught a couple articles on that, but they're running into difficulty where they're, they're hurting the restaurants because they're not allowing straws. And I don't want to do anything. This is part of what I think is what we're seeing that's going on here in the city of St. Cloud. We're making one move because we think it's going to be, be good, but we're not realizing that that one move that's then puts something into play that we then have two, three, and four other things that end up occurring, and in a lot of instances, it ends up damaging other areas that, we, that were unintended consequences. So we need to really think through what we're going to do, and I would hate to give an answer that could end up damaging one of our businesses that may already be struggling in the process of trying to, to sound like I know what I'm talking about when it needs further research. Thank you. Dave Masters. Um, there are a number of things that the city currently is doing. I, I, my understanding is that the city actually produces more energy than it uses. Uh, the power uh, hydro dam, which is right uh, near the university, generates a lot of electricity and uh, brings in additional money to the city um, on the range of 200000 250000 a year. So that's, uh, that's a factor there. Um, the wastewater treatment plant uh, produces fertilizer, uh, you know, making pellets and so forth from some of the waste um, solar panels, solar gardens are the wastewater treatment plant. You know, those, those are helping to produce uh, clean energy. Um, you know, we could also take a look at uh, putting solar panels on some other facilities such as the MAC, that kind of thing. I know there's been some discussion with regards to that. So I think the more that we look at um, using uh, reusable energy in regards to wind, solar, um, biothermal, those kinds of things, or geothermal as well, are all going to be factors in um, making it a cleaner environment for everyone. Um, and again, I'd say uh, probably the, the recycling program has gone pretty well uh, with the new bins that were put out, and um, I think that people are utilizing those much more. Thank you. George Wendell. I'm getting a little deja vu here. I say this every day. Back when I was uh, in Isandland County, I was also the solid waste uh, officer for student care for the city, that particular county. And um, uh, this was during the time that uh, they were trying to get all of the waste out of landfills and try to 
figure out other ways to recycle it or get compost or whatever the case might be. So I have quite a bit of background in this area. I actually have to compliment the city of St. Cloud. I think the uh, individual uh, recycling uh, situation that they have is about as good as I've seen in almost any city that I've been to. And I've been to a lot of cities that I look at their uh, uh, recycling programs, and St. Cloud has one of the best. I also uh, served on the uh, St. Cloud Area Sustainability Task Force that I think was headed up by uh, uh, some staff people at the city of St. Cloud and invited the county and some of the other cities in the area to join that. And part of our task was to try to uh, see what we could do to limit the carbon footprint of uh, the city of St. Cloud and the surrounding areas. So we worked very closely with businesses at that time. We worked very closely with restaurants to try to deal with uh, food waste and try to find ways that uh, that could be Recycled, and I think we've made some progress. I'm not sure where that's at. I haven't uh, obviously been on that uh, task force for a couple of years, but I think St. Cloud is heading in the right direction. Mike Cogburn. Yeah, I, I must admit the, uh, the the recycling programs here available in St. Cloud are, are some of the best. I, I my family takes advantage of the, the the carts and all that. As far as it comes to styrofoam and plastic. You know, I think just I think common sense would say that the businesses can handle that, and and that is something the city doesn't need to get into micromanaging of whether or not somebody uses a cardboard or plastic or foam or whatever for their to-go containers. I think that's something that the businesses can handle, and and if the community decides they don't want to patronize somebody because of what they put their food in, then that's a business decision they'll make. Um, I heard a couple of things: uh, solar gardens and solar panels and things like that. And I was listening to an interesting uh, study about the solar gardens and how the subsidies of those are actually raising the cost of kilowatt hours through NSP, uh, uh, through Northern States, because it costs more and they're not as efficient as they could be. The last week in this town would probably point to the fact that not a whole lot of solar energy would be gained from those. I'm not a big proponent of solar, solar energy until it is cost effective. Right now, without subsidies, it's not cost effective. There's no place that is selling showing it as cost effective. So that's where I would stand on that. Um, as far as regular refuse, um, I think there's some things that the city needs to have open discussions. I think Liz is right in that that's an area that needs to be discussed and we need to further explore how that can be handled. Thank you. John Lippert. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming the question that was asked was relating to. We want to ban uh, bags and the styrofoam cups. That, that's the way I read it. But I, I can't see micromanaging the businesses, as Mr. Conway said. It's just not fair that the city reaches that far into it. But I, in regards to um, our recycling program, is excellent. We have been uh, uh, people of other communities that say in Minnesota come to us and ask what we're doing because our percentages have increased tremendously with the new carts. Uh, we may be able to go back at them and remind people to recycle. Uh, it does take a little bit of an effort and it does take a little bit of marketing. But we do, the same club does a very good job of uh, energy, uh, recycling. I'm proud of what we're doing. We have new uh, recycling trucks and uh, I, I really do think we're doing a good job. And uh, it can always be better. Never, never say never. But uh, if, uh, getting to the question again, if it's related to, um, Styrofoam cups, I just assume I have them, but I'm not going to start demanding businesses not use them. Thank you. Paul Brand Mike. I think John and Mike uh, both summed it up pretty well. I think too that you, you, market demands will will make changes that are necessary. I heard, I think it was just this morning on the radio, I don't remember which major fast food chain it was, but they said they're going to use all biodegradable takeout containers. Well, that's market demand. I don't think the government should be dictating those things, and I think that um, we should be able to use technology and, and uh, market market forces in order to to drive the direction we want to go. I also agree we have a great recycling program. As I said, I've lived and worked around the world, and I've seen a lot, a lot of different programs. Um, when I was a Cub Scout leader, um, I took my pack to uh, to the recycling centers over there on the, on the east side. Pretty fascinating facilities. You get, excuse me, you get in there, and take a look around. There's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in there. And I went down to the solid, um, you know, the refuse place down in Elk River one time, and 
18, 20 years ago. And uh, well, they, they've got quite an operation going there too. They got you know, big tractors and everything moving stuff around. So I think there's definitely a, an ability to be able to recycle more. And I like the fact that the Sync Club Times ran the several days of articles on things that we're doing right, things we're doing wrong, things that are need to be changed or, or need more attention. So I was doing things, uh, there were some things that I, I, I wasn't rinsing well enough, you know, that's what I think in a, in a, my aluminum can or tin cans. So, uh, you know, you make those changes and then you, you're not messing up the, uh, the whole bin because you've got the wrong materials in there or that's contaminated. Steve Letterman. This is a very good question because uh, I saw a documentary not too long ago that uh, talked about a floating island of plastic in, in the Pacific Ocean off the island, off the islands of Midway that was twice the size of the state of Texas. So it's a major issue. I, I tell you though, what I would want to do first is, is uh, put together some subject matter experts to look at the issue and determine what can be done. I'm a little concerned with the unintended consequences of that. Would it impact business? What you know? What would be the, the impact? I can say that the uh, recycling that we currently have in uh, St. Cloud has been accepted very, very well by the, the citizens. They like it, they utilize it, uh, and it's worked uh, very well. If we're looking at things that we could do right away, I think one of the things would be to, you know, perhaps uh, put a charge five cents for a bag, plastic bags. I hate those things, seeing them flying around all over the place. Uh, the city of St. Cloud did move to uh, biodegradable garbage bags, so your green green bags that you buy are biodegradable, so that's something that could potentially be done. It would have to be, I think, cost effective to figure that out. Also, I'll stop there. <laughs> John Palmer. I'm concerned, concerned about waste. Now, I hear people talk about what do you do with your leaves? And your branches, that the rule about branches is a certain length. Um, I think we need to take a look at waste in a general way and turn it into something that might be of economic value. We have marvelous uh, businesses on the east side that have created uh, and served the market for steel. Steel. We recycle an awful lot of steel over on the east side. I hope we can do things to help that expand. Uh, and help it be part of uh, an effort. I too am concerned about uh, the government's record in making decisions for individual people. I don't think that's been uh, a very strong thing. I trust that the marketplace uh, will respond. Uh, I began recycling in 60 years ago because it was economically advantageous to me. And I think that what we need to look at is how do we enhance people's choices and inform them, inform them with accurate information. The recycling phenomena has created a glut so that many of the things are not worth very much anymore. And we're going to need to look at what do we do with those things that nobody wants to buy anymore. That that stream of waste, you can't get anything anymore for use brand. And the next question is, what are your top two or three budget priorities for the city of St. Cloud? And we are going to start this one with Steve Larrowin. Well, I think, uh, number one, I believe we should have a balanced budget. Uh, I would uh, like to see focus put on I truly believe that uh, we should uh, support that. And I believe that we're either growing or we're contracting. And growth and, and businesses and money put towards uh, those can help, uh, you know, can help with jobs and, and all the other things that follow after that. So economic development is a key thing. I think we also need to take a close look at what we can do for affordable housing. I also 
also believe that, you know, as I've, as I've been door knocking, the, uh, the number one item by more than two to one that people talk about are the roads. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see the roads, uh, more money put towards the roads. The issue, however, is uh, we have 400 miles of roads that we do we fix and repair about 40 miles a year. So you either have to be in the top priority there or you're going to be overlooked. And I'd like to see that uh, change, more money uh, put towards that. Mike Conway. Thank you. That's a, good, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I would first look at is how we spend the city's dollars. It's as important as what we spend it on. Uh, I think one of the first things we need to do is do a thorough overview and to see, okay, are we doing uh, with what we get? Are we being as well, being the most effective as we can? Um, and, and I agree. One of the one of the things I'm hearing um, when I'm talking to people is the roads, and especially um, because we're the fourth ward. If you try to get anywhere down by the new high school. That building that lately. Um, County Road 74 is open, just to let you know. Um, but that place has been a mess. And as soon as they closed County Road 74 for the schoolwork, they just, the county decided to do a bunch of re redoing on the county roads. I think one of the things that we can do with stretching our dollars, as mentioned earlier, we have a lot of roads to maintain. But I think if we did a much more coordinated effort with our cities, neighbor cities, like Wade Park, Sauk Rapids, Sartell, and when we work with the counties to say, okay, you guys, you're planning and working in this area. Well, we got a couple of city roads that are right in that same area. How can we utilize the crews that are there? Because once the crews are there, they don't care what they're doing. They're just putting pavement down. So who pays for it? I think a coordinated effort would make our dollars on the roadways go a lot faster. Um, Wade Park just did a nice job on 2nd Avenue over by the golf course over there. They, they paved that whole section. It looks great. And then they stopped right at the city of St. That needs to change. Thank you. Dave Baskers. Well, I think if you look at our, our current budget, I would say that we certainly have put an emphasis on roads, 18.4 million, and um, that will help to uh, rejuvenate and renovate a lot of those roadways. Uh, a second area is that those partnerships. I mean, I look at, for example, you know, the Rotary working with the city to um, by Summertime by George, and the revenue that's generated by that activity is put back into the park, put back into, into um, community um, build, or not necessarily buildings, but community um, support systems like the, the uh, parkway system at, over by uh, Cathedral. So looking at how to, how to utilize that money. Um, so I think the more that we can encourage more partnerships with other entities, private entities, we can get a bigger bang for our dollar. Um, I look at the school district, Tech High School, the idea that um, you know they, they decided to sell that to the city for $1 because the city has the ability through the EDA to offer incentives to developers to then further um, propose a project that otherwise wouldn't be feasible. So TIF money um, would be an incentive for businesses to come in and develop that. And that could lead to affordable housing. Affordable housing at that site um, would be a factor, or affordable housing in general in the city. One last thing I would like to say is that um, I think I hear from a lot of um, companies, sp specifically uh, construction, that uh, we need more uh, workforce. And so if we spend some investment in developing a workforce, it would be helpful. Thank you. Liz Backlish. <laughs> It's a great question, thank you. Uh, so first off, I agree, uh, how it is spent is, is definitely very important. We should be looking at that, see if there are ways to reduce costs, to do things um, more intelligently, rather than always relying on being able to pull more money out. But the question was, what are our top two or my top two or three budget priorities? So economic development, um, police, because they are uh, directly related to our safety in the community, and infrastructure, which for me would be good roads and also parking. Um, and the police and the infrastructure, having us be safe, having us have good roads and also places to park, I believe directly affect our economic development and our ability to attract in new businesses. 
and um, to then help them develop. So first off, people need to feel safe in coming here and wanting to be here. They need to have a place to, to put their vehicles when they're, when they're gonna come in, and also nice roads to travel on in order to get here. Um, the economic development thing is huge. We're losing businesses, and I mean, if you just drive around and start looking, there's open storefronts all over the place. We have open housing all over the place, and this is something that's going to affect all of us. We are a core city that is right now in jeopardy of dying. And we can fix that and we can reverse it, but we do need to start working on these three issues, putting them together. And um, again, big thing, supporting our police. There's actually a report out there I've not been able to get my hands on that I believe tells us that we actually have a need for putting more police on the streets right now. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, you know, this is a great question for me. As I mentioned, I served as the ex or the Stearns County Administrator for 28 years. I also served as the ex Sandy County Coordinator for five years, and uh, during those three, three years, I was the Chief Budget Officer for both of those entities. So it was my job to put together a, a county budget to present to the county board for approval. Uh, a couple of things uh, about uh, uh, budget making. Uh, first of all, um, again, using uh, public and private partnerships as uh, Mr. Masters had mentioned is very is very key. You can uh, you can leverage uh, local dollars with uh, pu uh, private dollars, and you can get a lot more done. And I think you gave some some good examples of that. Uh, also, uh, it's very important that uh, you understand that uh, with a city budget, any kind of local government budget, you take a lot of the dollars that you levy, and you actually leverage those to get a whole lot more dollars from other. Other uh, locales, such as the city, such as the uh, federal government or the state government, we did that at the county. They do that at the city. The better you are at doing that, the better chance you have of improving the top two priorities, which I believe are number one, public safety; number two, roads and road congestion. Thank you, John Palmer. The top priority would be to come up with a plan and fund that plan to change the report that's out there regarding our city's ability to, or its crime rate. We receive an F. We have some of the highest crime rates uh, in the nation and in this state. And we need to take a hard look at what we can do to uh, improve that very unhappy grade. One way to do that is to place it on the agenda of the city council. I would like to see a review of how we're doing in fighting crime in this city at every council meeting. I learned a long time ago that which you count, that which you look at, is that which you end up working on. Prevention of crime contributes to the brand that can attract people to come to the city. It's part of economic development. Maintenance of roadways and infrastructure also is part of the brand because businesses want to be able to get their raw material to their place of production and get their raw material out to their customers. And it seems to me we need to do a dual priority, economic development through infra infrastructure and most importantly, uh, reducing or improving the grade that we receive for crime in the city. John Lebert. Well, as a council member, I'm representing the third ward, and this is the people, and the people, and we've had surveys and crime prevention, uh, roads, and uh, we, we categorize on those, and those are my highest priorities. But I'm also a fiscal conservative. I don't like to spend money that we don't have. And uh, we just put $18 million into roads this year additional. We want to do that next year. We're, I'm not just going to say we're in great shape, but we are working on it. But we also need economic development. We need businesses. We also, more critical, we need good quality employees. We need college educated. We need uh, people that are welders. We need good trained people to come here, uh, which in turn, we need to have an atmosphere that they want to come. Need to have a viable community. We need to uh, not have any um, strife or, or problems. We need to paint a picture that people want to come here. 
We need the arts. We need uh, uh, good communities. We need it clean. We, there's a lot of things. Take a look at the city and say that love at first sight. You need to do that. You need to create an atmosphere. If you look at our EDA website, it is an excellent picture of St. Cloud. We're creating a community. We need to do that. We need to get the St. Cloud Hospital has had 800 job opportunities. We have hundreds and, and hundreds and thousands of job opportunities here in St. Cloud, but we don't have the people to fill them. We need people to come here. We, we can't uh, uh, just sit back and not have that. Paul Brandmeier. Well, the problem with going last is there's not a whole lot I can add to what's already been said. Um, so I think we need more roundabouts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a joke. Um, I, I agree with uh, Steve that we need to make sure that we take a good hard look at the budget. John said the same thing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fiscal conservative too. I, I, we need to look at what we're spending already. We need to look at um, how we can reduce the cost of certain things. Um, and I agree with, with what Liz was saying. And several people have said actually that law enforcement is, is uh, where is that? Isn't that right, John? But in law enforcement, right? Met a lot of cops over the, over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, boy, we got some really quality law enforcement here. These guys know what they're doing. Uh, I think we can work closer, more collaboratively with our neighbors, perhaps. Um, I know uh, Dave Van Trude uh, has, has emphasized that as well. More training opportunities, uh, more visibility, uh, more community outreach. I think those are good things for law enforcement. Somebody mentioned walking around downtown. I think a, a constable on patrol is a good idea. Uh, that's cops, so we'll be constable on patrol. Um, roads, obviously, yeah, we need, uh, we need work on roads. As I was walking around Ward 3 and knocking on doors, that was one of the things that kept getting brought up was uh, safety downtown and, and the condition of the roads. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the things we need to work on. Thanks. And this will be our last question for this evening. What would you do to encourage more college students to stay in the St. Cloud area? Graduating, and we're going to start with George Vendelon. Give me a chance to think about this one. It all boils down to uh, uh, good opportunities and good jobs and a, and a great place to live. I think one of the things that uh, we have going for us here in St. Cloud is, is obviously we have a great education system. We have great. Uh, medical center. Uh, I th think what we do need to do though is to try to encourage more entrepreneurs to uh, develop their businesses in St. Cloud and create jobs, good paying jobs, uh, jobs that uh, well educated people uh, uh, would be happy to have. But I also think that um, people not only go to different communities because of their employment, they also go because of the quality of life in the community. And anything we can do as a city council to improve the quality of life in St. Cloud are things that I'm in favor of. Steve Larley. Well, I've had a chance, uh, as in my role as a past uh, chair of the St. Cloud Hospital, and currently I'm on the Center Care Board to uh, talk about recruiting. In fact, I had a meeting this morning Executive Committee met, and I am proud to say that there's uh, 71 new doctors and advanced practice providers that have been recruited to come to St. Cloud. And, and I asked the question, you know, give me one or two reasons why they came and, and what caused them to come here. And it boils down to a couple of things. <clears throat> for, for physicians and providers in the healthcare field, it has to do with how they get along with their, uh, their group, if they're a, a uh, cardiac doctor, how do they get along with the cardiac, other members of that group? And the second thing is how they like the city. You know, what, is, uh, what are the things that uh, cause them to come to the city? And that's very important. And uh, so and things like parks and arts and restaurants and things like that. So. Um, you know, I think if we can match some of the needs, and there are 800 open positions right now throughout the system, if we can match some of the needs and have some joint programs 
where we have businesses work with St. Cloud State to come up with the workforce development. That would, that would help. Mike Conway. This is a very interesting question because I think the question is, is a little behind the times because the question is really asking what do we do to keep the kids that go to St. Cloud State here? Well, first of all, you've got to get them to St. Cloud State. The enrollment in that college is only down 30% over the last couple of years. There's a serious issue. The students aren't coming. Why? Several programs that have been cut recently, um, some programs that are on the verge of getting cut. You look at the tech college, and they are bursting at the seams. The programs that are offered at the tech college, those kids are being successful. They're graduating and they're getting the jobs that they came for. St. Cloud State needs to do that. I'm a Husky grad. I graduated from education. I became a teacher. My first teaching job was in the west side of St. Paul. I lived in St. Cloud and drove to St. Paul every morning. I loved living in St. Cloud. But until, we, until the university has a, has a passion for producing products and services, i.e. people, that, the, that they can go find jobs, that's going to be a big issue. Um, one of the things I guess I would ask um, and for, those, for those new doctors and everybody that are coming here to St. Cloud, are they living in St. Cloud? Or are they just working in St. Cloud? There's a big difference. We need to get people that want to live in St. Cloud, not just work here. Thank you. John Lippert. Well, we need to create an image. We need to create a perception because college students aren't going to come here if we emphasize hate and bigotry, if we emphasize the bad, bad police. Uh, I disagree with downtown being a horrible place. It's not. It, the perception is wrong. We, as a city council, can create perceptions and we can enforce what, we're, what we feel is right for St. Cloud. We need to get that to the college students. We need to create uh, activities for them. Summertime by George is a great thing. We need arts. We need theater. We need music. We need all that type of stuff. We need good libraries. It's probably not as much important now as uh, the internet, but we need fiber optics. We, we, we need, to, I'm on the fiber optics board, so we need redundant work in St. Cloud. We're working on that. We need a lot of stuff in St. Cloud, but a lot of it has to be perception. And you have to concentrate on what we can actually do as a city council. And a lot of it is working with our EDA to create a, a beautiful place, a, a vibrant community, and uh, tell, tell it like it is. Because in the past, when I first got on the EDA board, we didn't have any direction. So what are we selling? We really don't know. We don't know what St. Cloud is. And we have to make what, what our perception of St. Cloud an image. We need to do that, and we need to enforce it, and we need to uh, market it. We need to have be welcoming and want just asking the students to stay here and what do they need. Dave Masters. No, I have uh, two children who are millennials and graduated recently and are just entering the work world. They're both teachers in the area. But one of the things that I hear from them and I hear from a lot of other young people that I work with is, is the quality of life is important where they live. They want to have um, the arts, music, um, you know, the aquatic center, for example. You know, health and fitness, those kinds of things. Um, you know, those amenities are important. You know, work is one aspect of your life, but you also want to enjoy a community and have those different functions to go to to have a more um, full and, and vital life. I think another area would be um, yeah, economic development, I agree. You know, providing a, a variety of employers that pay a living wage uh, for people who... Um, you know, are graduating from college and can look in the community and get into um, apprenticeships, internships, those kinds of things. And I think that would be helpful to, uh, once they are working in a, a job as an intern or apprentice, that they uh, may like it and decide, hey, I'd like to stay with this company because I can see a, a future. Um, other things I'd say is, um, you know, mobility. I, I hear a lot of young people say, you know, I don't need a car. I have young students in high school that they don't want their driver's license. They, they'd rather take the bus, you know, that kind of thing. So it's important for the city to provide that um, mode of transportation, buses, so that people can get around without the expense of uh, buying a car. Um, thank you. John Palmer. I spent 39 years of my life 
at St. Cloud State University. The last seven in key administrative positions. The question Mike asks is the most important question. They're not coming. Enrollment is not down 30%. It's down 40%. And it's a down again this year. And when you discount for the high school kids that never come to campus, it's down 50 or more percent. I have children also, two of which married and their husbands were not from this area, but my son is. My son's not college educated, but he's got a marvelous business and a work ethic. And what I hear him talk about is why he wants to leave. Why he wants to leave? He says, I want to get out of the ghetto. He says, I'm tired of hearing gunshots throughout the night in my neighborhood. I want to get my kids out of this place. And I'm back to crime. Let's admit it. It's here. Sure, we can talk about sex trafficking. Yeah, what are we doing about it to reduce it? What are we going to do as a city? I want it on the radar to be measured. Economic development will be driven and people will be attracted to this, new, this community based on reality. Liz Beckwith. Yeah, reality is not real fun some days. Um, I, I heard a comment about, you know, we can put forth the messaging that we want, and I'm not sure exactly how it was said, but it, that goes back to branding, and to a certain extent you can, the people know what's going on. When I first moved here, and it's, it's roughly 20 years ago, it's a little less, but close, I chose St. Cloud. I chose St. Cloud because I fell in love with it. It's a great place. And, and we've got some problems, but we absolutely can, can combat that, and we can fix them. So in doing that, and in encouraging the, the students to stay, first off, they do need to live here. There's, there's no question about that. We need, to, we need to set up a situation where they're going to enjoy their standard of living, and there's community involvement. And I'm not just, not just going to the theater and that kind of thing, but actually being involved in the community. When I first moved up here, one of the comments that I used to hear from people regularly was denigrating the students. We can't do that. We need to accept them, and we need to bring them in, and we need to want to hear from them. Um, the enrollment is way down. We've got to figure out how to do that. But Brandon, getting the students to stay here, I think that's the most important thing as far as, as, far as encouraging them to stay and creating opportunities. We have a whole southeast side that we can use, that we can use for economic redevelopment. Let's, let's pull ourselves together. Let's sit down and have some hard adult conversations and come up with a workable plan. Thank you. Paul Brandmeier. When I first moved to St. Cloud 20 years ago, uh, St. Cloud State had kind of the reputation of being a party school. That's why people came here was for the party. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's the case anymore. Um, as I say, enrollment is way down. So you got to ask yourself, well, why would they come to St. Cloud? Well, we need to have programs, like Mike was saying, we need to have programs that will bring them here. And if we want them to stay here, they, there needs to be something to do after. Okay, we've already talked about all the storefronts that are closing, manufacturing that's closing, and so forth. We've got a lot of manufacturing here, but now we're going to lose frigid air, electrolux, whatever they call this week. Um, we're going to lose that. We lost our creative memories. And there's all kinds of places that on Opportunity Drive um, that are closed. But we still have New Flyer and uh, Articat and a few other places out there. So there's a lot of manufacturing still going on in the St. Cloud area. So that's great for the tech college, but, but um, what's going on with our airport? You know? um, we have a lot of opportunity, but we're not really taking advantage of it. All right, so the bottom line is to answer the question, it seems like in order to bring people here, they've got to have a reason to come here. They need a program that's here, and then when they get here, they need to fall in love with the place. So we need to clean it up, fix it up, and give them jobs afterwards, because that's what they're supposed to come to school, come to college for, is to learn a skill that they can put to use. So I would also go along with the uh, business relationship of the school. The business should be saying, this is what we need people to be trained in, and then make it happen. Thank you. We have reached the end of our time for questions and we'll begin closing statements. 
You will each have one minute to summarize why you believe your qualifications are well matched with the requirements of being a city council member. And we will start with John Palmer. Thank you very much. I started by introducing the first question. There's a stark difference in the candidates that are running for city council. I did some math. There are three candidates who average 10 years on the council. I'd ask you to look at what's happened to this city in the last 10 years and say, have they been good stewards? The fourth candidate is a career manager in government, right in this area. I'd ask, how are things going? How has it worked out? What qualifies me to be on the council? I'm a contrarian. I'm a realist. I speak the truth, even if it's painful to hear. This town is at a tipping point. We go one way, but I've watched towns decline, or we tip and we go the other way. And I want St. Cloud to tip and become great again, again, and again. John Lippert. Thank you. Uh, I'm a doer. I get things done. I, I don't sit around and just take things for granted. I was co-chair of the governor's fishing open when I was here. That was one year of work. We had thousands and thousands of marketing hits in St. Cloud, and I did it for marketing. I did it for impressions. I did it for uh, St. Cloud. I've been to Guatemala twice on mission trips. I've been to Haiti. I've been to uh, Costa Rica. Um, I took advantage of uh, the governor's fishing opener, and I got involved with Granite City Day's youth fishing event. And we went from 300 uh, before my involvement to over 2,000 after uh, my involvement with it. So I get out and do things. I'm at Summertime with George to make myself available. My phone's there. My email's there. I'm out there all the time talking to people, and I want to hear from people. And I care, and that's the big thing. I have passion for St. Cloud. Steve Larrowy. I love serving the citizens of St. Cloud. I was appointed in 2015 and elected in 2016. I have worked hard to be an intelligent, contributing member to the city council. I have learned much and bring a unique set of skills to the table. My goals have been and they remain to maintain St. Cloud's fiscal stability when I'm not sacrificing growth. Number two is to support and strengthen St. Cloud's core neighborhoods. Three is to increase economic development and growth of St. Cloud. I think in the end, we all want to make a difference. In my opinion, there's no better place to do that than where you live, where you work, and where you have raised your family. And all of those happen in St. Cloud. I would appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. George Bendelow. You know, many of my friends have asked me, why on earth are you going to run for city council? <laughs> You're retired. You and Marianne love to travel. You have a great life. Why do you want to sit on the city council? Well, I tell them, and I'm telling you, I'm running for city council because I'm very bullish on St. Cloud. I raised my family here. St. Cloud is a great education center. There's three uh, universities. It's got great technical colleges. We're a big retail center. We're a mecca, major medical center. And we have some of the greatest neighborhoods that I've ever seen. My goal is to maintain and improve St. Cloud is a major regional center where I think sometimes people don't realize St. Cloud's pretty big time. And if you don't live in St. Cloud, you might not even realize that. But St. Cloud is looked upon as a big regional center. I want to maintain uh, St. Cloud as a major regional center, and I want to improve the lives of our residents. I think I have the skills to do it. Thank you. Mike Conway. First of all, I want to say thank you to uh, the League of Women Voters for this evening. Um, a couple of things that have, have been talked about, one of them I want to be on the record for is the, the development vision for the tech plan, uh, the tech theory right now. I can't, the, but the, whatever the vision was last night wasn't the vision that, that the residents of that area have expressed to me. Um, what do I bring to the table? I am not and have not been in government before. 
I don't know how it's supposed to be done. I'm going to do it the way you guys need me to do it. In the fourth ward, we have a lot of growth potential. We have a lot of diversity specifically to that area. So we have some city, what I would call hardcore city, core city uh, issues, and we also have some rural issues. My favorite saying, again, you've heard me say it before, help me understand. My name is Mike Conway. My platform is very simple. Conservative common sense leadership. Thank you. Paul Redmire. As I stood my post and did my duty over the years, I assumed that my elected representatives were faithfully doing the same back home. I mailed my absentee ballots year after year, feeling I was doing my civic duty and that my representatives were voting in my best interest. I got to vote in, first, in person for the first time in 1998 here in Minnesota at the age of 39. That was the year that the state began what I called the Jesse Ventura experiment. <laughs> From that I determined maybe I need to pay a little more attention to what's happening in politics. So I joined the BPO, BPOU, eventually became co-chair, ran for Minnesota House four years ago. I've chaired caucuses and conventions and I've been a delegate to all levels of conventions up to and including Minnesota State Central. I've often said I can't change the whole world, but by golly, I can change my little piece of it. I'm concerned about the loss of voices of the citizens at all levels of government, not just local. I figure I can either gripe about it or get in there and do something to change it. So that's why I'm getting involved and running. It's time to hold citizens accountable. Liz Backlund. First off, I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, also, all the volunteers and supporters, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, qualifications. I care and I listen. Trust me, I would not be doing this if I did not care and if I did not feel very strongly about what's going on. And I want to talk to everybody. Every Sunday afternoon, I'm having listening sessions. I'm also door knocking, but it is taking an incredible amount of time because I have doors that I'll go up to and I'll end up spending an hour here because these people feel like they have not been heard before. So if I haven't made it to your door yet and you live in my ward, please know I'm on my way. If not, come see me on Sunday. Um, you can find it on my website. I have a big voice and I want to use it for you. I know I'm supposed to be an employee of the people. This is not, my opinions are not what's important. It's what needs to be done to help the citizens. Um, always been called a troublemaker. And in response to one thing, I just want to say real quick, we spoke to our congressional delegates, we spoke to the state, we spoke to uh, our, our, all of our leaders, and what ended up happening was is we ended up down in council, and we just kept going to know where to go, and I'm here now. Thank you. Dave Masters. You know, I've lived in St. Cloud all my life, but I'm, I'm proud to be a St. Cloud citizen. I, um, you know, I've been a teacher and a coach for many years in the district, to work with a lot of young people. I try to inspire young people to do service learning, to take part in their community. Um, students have been involved in working at the greenhouse, um, you know, uh, working with uh, a variety of parks uh, down at Munsinger and so forth. So I myself want to be a role model and uh, provide service to the community as well. You know, I, another thing I just want to mention is that um, the CQ uh, group, and my opponent talks about I speak the truth. Um, I know that these flyers were handed out into doors and so forth, uh, 23 items that are uh, potential uh, criminal things that are happening in the city of St. Cloud. I'm going to ask that you check the data to make sure it's accurate, because after speaking with the police chief, he had mentioned that many of these items are false. And so when you talk about speaking the truth, Mr. Palmer, I want you to uh, recognize accurate data from the uh, police department. Thank you. No. No. no, no. The forum is over. Thank you, audience members.